Hello, and welcome back. It's time for another round of input lag measurements. In my previous video, I was primarily focused on input lag while in the variable refresh rate range. So with my VG27AQ, a 165Hz monitor, that limited the testing to frame rates below 165 FPS. But what if you're really concerned about latency? Doesn't variable refresh add more lag, and shouldn't you just turn VSync off and run your game at the highest frame rate possible? So that's what this video will be about, VSync off. If you're willing to give up the massive visual improvements of using variable refresh rate, what do you get in return? I still play a ton of Quake 2 at 1000 FPS with VSync off, and I do so for a reason. I'm willing to live with the constant screen tearing because the improvement in responsiveness is worth it. But obviously, very few new games can run at 1000 FPS, so I can't just keep using Quake 2. For this video, I'm going to be testing some more modern competitive games. Quake Champions, Destiny 2, Call of Duty Warzone, and Apex Legends. Now you may have noticed that three of those four use NVIDIA's new Reflex Anti-Lag technology. That's going to be important because with my test system, I've only got a 1070 Ti, so I'll be running into GPU bottlenecks a lot. And running a GPU at 100% utilization is just about the worst thing you can do if you care about lag. So for this video, in addition to the VSync off tests, I'll revisit NVIDIA's external driver-enforced ultra low latency mode, or ULLM, and compare it with the built into the game reflex results. But let's start with how I'm testing lag. I have a microcontroller send a USB command to the PC. That could be a key press or a mouse movement. And with my newer, more sensitive light probe, I can now capture any brightness changes by placing the probe around 25 centimeters from the screen. For VSync off, this is critical because I need to catch the very first new frame, no matter where it shows up on the screen. Probes that only look at the center of the screen may miss new frames if they pop up just below the sensor. Unless you intend to capture a lot of samples, like I do for my other reviews where I capture 800 measurements, capturing the whole screen is better. You could also do this with a 1000 FPS camera, but that only captures the screen every one millisecond. The microcontroller, on the other hand, has much higher precision. I can read the light probe every 15 microseconds. But for this to work properly, I need the whole screen, or nearly the whole screen, to rise from very dark to very light. The bigger the contrast, the better. I can easily do this with my super simple UE4 build, but getting this same behavior in games is going to be much trickier, but I'll get into that soon. Let's start with UE4 on the Lenovo Y27Q20. This build, much like Quake 2, is great for demonstration purposes because both the CPU and GPU render times are so fast. Let me put up the raw results that I captured at 1000 FPS VSync off. For UE4, I captured 128 black to white transitions, and I had a program called Octave run through all the data to find the first moment that each response left the steady state low value. I love these graphs, by the way. Look at how tight the grouping is. At 1000 FPS, from a USB key press to seeing something happen on screen only takes an average of 3.12 milliseconds, and the range is from 2.57 to 4.04 milliseconds. These, of course, don't take into account the LCD transition time, which for the Lenovo here will take about 8 milliseconds before you finally see white, but what we're interested in here is just the game latency. But what if I cut the frame rate in half? Here's 500 FPS, a 2 millisecond render time. The minimum is still roughly the same, but the spread gets wider. This is the expected behavior for VSync off. At 400 FPS, same thing. Same minimum, but larger spread. Watch as I keep lowering the frame rate with UE4's internal cap. Sometimes we get lucky with our inputs happening right before a new frame is presented, other times we have to wait a full refresh cycle. Capped at 60 FPS, the average latency is around 12.5 milliseconds, which is actually quite good. But the lesson here is plain. If you want the lowest latency possible, run your games at the highest frame rate you can, as long as you don't max out your GPU. But again, we'll get there. I showed these octave graphs mostly because I like the way they look, but let's put all this data into an easier to understand format. For UE4 and the rest of the upcoming games, I want to show two charts. The first is a box plot, which contains all the results, and then a simpler bar chart with just the average latency. The box plots are a little harder to read, but I think they give the best illustration of what's really happening. The minimums for all the internal caps are near identical, but the spread of the responses increases and consequently the average lag keeps rising, which you can see on the bar chart. One thing you may be wondering is how much turning on adaptive sync hurts latency. 
Since the Y27Q20 is a 165Hz monitor, I went back and took the same measurements at 150fps, 100fps, and 60fps with VRR enabled, and I'll put those on the chart now. At 150fps, enabling adaptive sync increases average latency from 6.4 to 7.7 milliseconds, and that happens mostly because now we have a higher lag floor. That makes sense. With VRR, we no longer get partial frames. The same holds at 100fps and 60fps as well. So if you want to save maybe 1.5 milliseconds, you can turn adaptive sync off, although I personally don't think that's worth giving up a tear and judder free experience. But no matter, this video is about vsync off. Before I started testing Destiny 2, Warzone, etc., I wanted to figure out how I was going to emulate the same black to white behavior in actual games. So I went to one of my old standbys, EasyQuake. EasyQuake is great because it'll run at thousands of frames per second, and my first thought was to use the muzzle flash of the default shotgun. If I could fire it close to a wall, the flash would illuminate most of the screen. But there were two problems with that. The first is that it's very hard to get enough contrast between the dark wall and the lit wall. Quake is very brown even at its brightest. The fix there was to jump into the NVIDIA control panel and min-max the gamma and contrast sliders. This worked great, so I ended up using it for the other games as well, except for Destiny 2, which ignores all custom color settings. But the second problem, the big one, was this. Even at 4,900 FPS, the muzzle flash is delayed by an average of about 20 milliseconds, so this can't be used for latency testing. That doesn't mean that other testing that looks at muzzle flashes is wrong or bad, but EasyQuake's implementation doesn't work. But there's a better way. The most important aspect of why a game feels either responsive or laggy is how quickly the viewport changes when you move your mouse. With keyboard inputs that move your character or jump, there will almost always be acceleration and deceleration built into the engine, and it takes a lot of latency for those to become a problem. But if there's significant latency with mouse movement, you'll feel it right away. So for lag testing, I decided to have the microcontroller initiate a mouse movement. With the in-game mouse sensitivity cranked, the mouse event would cause the screen to look up or down immediately. And with EasyQuake, it's easy enough to cheat and go out of bounds to get a black screen. For other games, this will be a bit harder, but let's take a look at the lag results of EasyQuake at 4,900 FPS. This is really good. The average latency before at least some part of the screen starts changing is only 2.43 milliseconds, with a minimum of only 1.87 milliseconds. This is just one more illustration of why frame rate is king for reducing lag. But no modern game is running at 1000 FPS with minuscule CPU and GPU render times. So how about latency in a real proper and modern competitive game, something like Quake Champions? I chose Quake Champions because it has a couple of features that make my testing much easier. Number one, an internal frame rate cap, and number two, broad resolution scaling. Actually, all the games I tested included these, except for Apex Legends, which ended up being a pain to test. But these two settings allow me to test two situations. By lowering the rendering resolution way down to Potato Town, I can take the GPU out of the equation and see how the game behaves at various frame rates using the in-game cap. I'll refer to these as CPU limited. Then, to find what happens when the GPU is the limiting factor, I can turn off the frame cap and adjust the render resolution higher and higher to drop the frame rate back down to the same frame rates I used with the cap. So for instance, at 25% resolution scaling, Quake Champions can do 120 FPS capped with only 34% GPU load on my 1070 Ti. But if I run uncapped and set the resolution scaling up to 110%, the GPU goes to 100% utilization and the frame rate naturally drops down to 120 FPS. With modern games at QHD resolution, this is the more likely scenario. You'll almost always be GPU limited, so it's important to test latency in this case. In my previous video, I verified Battle Nonsense's results of getting really high lag with max GPU use, and the results will be similar here. But let's start with the 25% resolution scaling results. Amazingly, looking off into the background of Awoken, Quake Champions can hit 420 FPS on my 7700K, and in that case, I only measured an average latency of 8.7 milliseconds. That is more than double the lag of what my simple UE4 build was doing at 400 FPS, but at that frame rate in Quake Champions, my 1070 Ti was at a much higher 59% utilization, compared to 22% for UE4. But look at what happens when I use the internal frame rate limiter to cap to 240, 120, and 60 FPS. All the measurements start jumping up, and by a lot. Unlike UE4's limiter, Quake Champions seems to be dumb in that it samples inputs 
and then just stalls the engine until that frame duration has passed. With almost no GPU load at 60 FPS, the internal cap is causing lag to shoot up to 32 milliseconds with the very best response at 22.8. Contrast that with UE4's 60 FPS cap. Average latency of 12.5, minimum 2.8 milliseconds. None of the other games I tested for this video have this same sort of behavior with their limiters, so Quake Champion's internal limiter is just bad. For the best latency results for Quake Champions, turn VSync off and run the game as fast as you can, again, as long as you don't max out your GPU. But let's look at that situation now. The next results on the chart show Quake Champion's latency when my 1070 Ti was at 100% utilization. I wanted to make the frame rates match exactly, but I couldn't set the resolution scaling higher than 200% to drop that 65 FPS down to 60, but it's close enough. At 240 FPS, latency only increased a little compared to the capped low GPU use situation, 11.4 milliseconds to 16.1 milliseconds. That's not too bad. At super high frame rates, having a much nicer, sharper image only cost about 4.7 milliseconds of latency. But at 120 FPS, the GPU limited situation jumps to 30.6 milliseconds of lag, and it's even worse at 65 FPS, which has 53 milliseconds of lag before we see the first mouse movement appear on screen. One thing I also tested in my previous video was NVIDIA's Ultra Low Latency Mode, or ULLM. I found that it worked pretty well to decrease lag in GPU limited situations, and that's also true here. At that same 65 FPS, enabling ULLM drops the average lag down to 42.9 milliseconds. Still high, but better than 53. There's only so much that external driver-enforced frame pacing can do. Quake Champions brings up an interesting problem for those of us who care about latency. It's an unfortunate fact that using all the GPU we've paid for causes lag to increase, and increase a lot. Imagine spending $700 on a graphics card, but having to run games at half resolution just to keep your latency down. NVIDIA happily realized this was a problem and provided something to developers called Reflex. Instead of being external like ULLM, NVIDIA's Reflex SDK is implemented in the game engines themselves, and it serves as a just-in-time rendering mode. Reflex essentially drops the GPU render queue and continuously adjusts the timing of the CPU work until right before the GPU needs a new frame to render, so we get the freshest and newest inputs. Reflex is currently in only a handful of games, three of which I'll be testing for this video, but I want to start the latency testing with Destiny 2. Destiny 2 is great because, like Quake Champions and UE4, it has an easily accessible internal cap and a great render resolution slider. Reflex is enabled by default, but if you want to disable it for testing, you can modify your CVARS.XML and set it off or on with 0 or 1, or you can use 2 for Reflex Boost. Unless otherwise stated, I turn Reflex off for the next several tests. Destiny 2 is also a good game to start with because I can test four different scenarios. Number one, CPU limited or capped. Number two, GPU limited. Number three, GPU limited with ULLM. And number four, GPU limited with Reflex. And as you'll see coming up, Destiny 2 really highlights how important Reflex is. But we'll get there. My test scene was in this cave on Nessus. And with the game set to full-on potato mode with a resolution scale of 25%, my 7700K was able to push 220 frames per second. At that frame rate, mouse latency was around 14.1 milliseconds. That's worse than Quake Champions at a similar frame rate, and much worse than UE4, but Destiny 2 is a more complex game. But unlike Quake Champions, its internal cap works properly. Cap to 120 FPS, with the GPU only around 36% utilization, lag only rose to 16.8 milliseconds. But notice the minimum is still the same as at 220 FPS, much like UE4. Capping at 60 FPS increases the lag to 21.4 milliseconds, but again, it's a range. The minimum lag for all the internal caps is around 11.5 milliseconds. But when switching over to the GPU limited scenarios, this is where things really go off the rails for Destiny 2. Bumping the resolution scale up to 85%, I got the same 220 FPS as before, but this time at 100% GPU utilization. Average latency increased to 18.8 milliseconds. That's not actually too bad. So at very high refresh rates, there's only around a 4 millisecond disadvantage to running your GPU at max tilt. But look at what happens when we're GPU limited at 120 FPS. Lag jumps to 41.2 milliseconds, and at 60 FPS, it's now 80.3 milliseconds. I wasn't actually expecting any lag this bad, so I had to reprogram my microcontroller to capture more samples. So the lesson here, just like with Quake Champions, is to make sure your GPU isn't running at 100%. But realistically, many of you are stuck in the same boat as I am. 
With the GPU market the way it is, my 1070 Ti is going to have to last until 2022, and modern games are going to be maxing the GPU all the time. But now we have two options to help, Ultra Low Latency Mode and Reflex. Let's start with the external ULLM first. At 220 FPS, ULLM doesn't make much difference, maybe even a skosh worse. At 120 FPS, ULLM drops the lag from 41.2 milliseconds down to 35.9. Okay, that is an improvement. And at 60 FPS, ULLM drops the lag from that crazy 80.3 milliseconds down to 66.6. .6. That's a good improvement for a driver-based frame control. But still, playing Destiny 2 at 2560x1440 at 60 FPS with 67 milliseconds of lag every time you move the mouse doesn't feel great. But what about Reflex? Here's where the good stuff happens. At 220 FPS, Reflex is only about one millisecond better than the pure GPU limited case. But at 120 FPS, instead of 41.2 or 35.9, Reflex allows that to drop to 24.3 milliseconds. And the improvement at 60 FPS is staggering. 80.3 milliseconds down to 66.6, .6, down to 39.7. Reflex cut the lag at 60 FPS in half. 40 milliseconds, though, is still about twice as high as in the non-GPU limited scenario, so you'd be better off staying away from that GPU limit to begin with. But Reflex works, and it's pretty amazing. Another Reflex-enabled game is Call of Duty Warzone. I had intended to run the same battery of tests on Warzone as with Destiny 2, but Warzone on my puny 1070 Ti is GPU limited all the time, even at the lowest resolution scaling offered in the menus. So for this game, I don't have any CPU limited results, but interestingly, Warzone allows both Reflex and Reflex Boost to be selected in the menu. Boost keeps GPU clocks high when outside of GPU limited scenarios to keep GPU frame times quick, but in my case where I'm always GPU bottlenecked, it shouldn't make any difference. But may as well test it just to be sure. Let's look at the results. Again, with potato mode engaged, I max out at around 230 FPS. At that frame rate, Warzone has about 15.7 milliseconds of mouse latency. That's slightly better than Destiny 2's 18.8 milliseconds at a simpler frame rate, but it's not as snappy as I was expecting. But just like Destiny 2, increasing the rendering resolution and detail level to drop the frame rate to 120 FPS and then to 60 FPS causes latency to rise dramatically. At 120 FPS, it takes 30 milliseconds for your mouse movements to show up. And at 60 FPS, that doubles to 63 milliseconds. I'll now add in Reflex and Reflex Boost. These two measure essentially identically. There's no improvement at 230 FPS, but Reflex does drop lag slightly at 120 FPS, around three milliseconds better. And it does a fantastic job at 60 FPS, saving about 14.5 milliseconds of lag. Oddly though, Reflex isn't helping Warzone as much as it was with Destiny 2. So now one more Reflex enabled game, Apex Legends. I'm very glad Respawn added Reflex to the game, but as of right now, there's no way to disable it, so I can't actually test how effective it is at cutting lag when GPU limited. So of course, all the Apex tests will be with Reflex on. Apex is also a bit annoying to test because you have to restart the game with a new command line argument every time you want to change the frame rate cap, and its internal resolution scaling is weirdly limited. Because of that, I can't quite match up the same 220, 120, and 60 FPS targets I was using before. I ended up using 220, 115, and 70, but I think those are close enough that we can make some comparisons to the other games. For Apex, I used the firing range map for my tests, and with all settings at their lowest, my 7700K topped out around 220 FPS. Looking at the CPU limited results first, it may be surprising to see that 220 FPS is performing a bit worse than the 115 FPS cap. That's because at 220 FPS, my 1070 Ti was at a quite high 80% utilization. When capped to 115 FPS, the GPU use also saw a corresponding decrease, down to 42%. GPU use matters, guys. Looking at the box plots, Apex's internal limiter is behaving well, so the 220, 115, and 70 FPS caps all have the same minimums, and the latency here is really quite good. But take a look at the Reflex GPU limited results. At 220 FPS, Apex has about the same latency as Warzone at around 15 milliseconds, but it's doing amazingly well at 120 and 60 FPS, 18.5 milliseconds and 23.8 milliseconds. The same advice still sticks. You shouldn't let your GPU run at 100% utilization, but if you do, the reflex implementation in Apex Legends is remarkably good. Okay, let's now compare the four games tested so far, all running GPU limited.
The frame rates here are approximate. For instance, Quake Champions is at 65 FPS instead of 60, and Apex is at 70, but this should give a general picture of how these games handle GPU limited scenarios. ULLM wasn't enabled for Quake Champions. Reading backwards from right to left, at high frame rates, most of these games are doing pretty well, around 16 milliseconds before a mouse movement can be measured on screen. But as the frame rate drops, the differences become more apparent. At 120 FPS, again GPU limited, Apex Legends is doing amazing, and interestingly, Destiny 2 is now performing a bit better than Warzone. Quake Champions, without either ULLM or Reflex, is starting to fall away from the rest of the pack. At 60 FPS, this is where we see the largest differences. Apex is insane. You probably wouldn't want to play Apex at 60 FPS anyway, but it's nice to know you could. Destiny 2 again beats Warzone by around 8.5 milliseconds, and Quake Champions has the highest latency at 53 milliseconds. Alright, that's all the data I have for this video, so let's move on to a quick summary. If you care about reducing latency, here are my recommendations. Number 1. Run your games at the highest frame rate you can, preferably over 200 frames per second. Frame rate is king for responsiveness. The higher the better. But that may be a tall order, so if you can't quite maintain that and you start dipping down to the 120 FPS range, number 2. Turn off Adaptive Sync. I hate to say this one because I personally wouldn't give up all the benefits of variable refresh to save 1.5 milliseconds of lag, but uh, you do you. Number 3. And this is the most important one. Don't max out your GPU. Just don't do it. Moreover, try to keep your GPU use below 90%. But suppose you can't help it, like in my case with Warzone. So, number four. If you have to run into GPU limits, turn on Reflex. Reflex does an outstanding job of limiting lag in GPU-bound scenarios, especially at low frame rates. Low here meaning anything below 120 FPS. If Reflex isn't in the game you play, and that game is DX11, a backup would be to use NVIDIA's ultra-low latency mode. It's not as effective as Reflex, of course, but it does help. That's all for this one. Thank you for watching.